Okay, welcome everyone. This is the Transforming Assessment Webinar Series. We are doing a special follow-up session today in the panel for you. And Sally Jordan will give us a brief introduction. So Sally, please. Thank you very much, Matthew, and thank you everyone. Um, as Matthew said, my name is Sally Jordan. I'm uh, here in, in Milton Keynes in, in the UK. My day job is working for the Open University. Um, but I just want to very briefly set the context for this. Um, something that now goes under the initials AHE um, was initially the Assessment in Higher Education Conference. Um, has been run in, in the UK um, for a number of years. Uh, we've had our fifth conference. We're preparing for our sixth one next year. Um, it's not from a fairly small scale conference at the University of Cumbria, but it's it's got bigger and bigger, and it, it's now a, a truly international conference running biennially. Um, and this year, the organising committee decided that we would have a smaller uh, event. That was the idea, in any case, that it would be a smaller event, much more seminar. Um, and that what we would focus on was the challenge of getting change at an institutional level. Um, and we had a meeting in Manchester a few weeks ago. Um, there's some photographs there of the event. Uh, had a really good attendance. There were about 120 people there. And as some of you will have realised, we, we had a live webinar from the keynote. I would say that if you haven't already listened to the keynote, I would strongly recommend that you do so. I found it really quite powerful. Um, and what Sue, who was giving the keynote, talked about essentially the barriers to getting that change in practice at a departmental institutional level. And she identified a very long list of barriers. And as I say, I haven't really got time to talk about all of them. Um, but she then also talked about a sort of vision way forward um, based around key principles, changing infrastructure, changes in strategy. And I think most significantly, changes in assessment literacy, where we get very used to talking about assessment literacy for students, but this was assessment literacy for our staff, which I think is really important. Anyway, you can go and find the um, the link to just put the, the link up there. Do have a listen to it. I say really good stuff. Um, but we decided we're now working in association with transforming assessment, trying to reach a, a different a wider audience, and it's absolutely great to have the international audience that we've got today. And what the um, organising committee have done is pick three of the presentations from the meeting in Manchester, ask them to repeat the presentation today, and the presentations are listed there on the screen. I just want to say why they were chosen. These three presentations were chosen before the conference, though I've heard very good things about them. But they were chosen because they really did address things that can be done to improve practice at an institutional level. So without further ado, I'm actually going to hand over now to Sally, who's going to give the first of the sessions. I'll just reiterate, each of them is going to speak to first something around 10, 15 minutes. Um, if we get a chance, we may just, I may just ask them some questions, but we want to reserve the time for a wider discussion at the end. So if you've got points you want to make in the meantime, type them into the chat box. Um, if we get the opportunity at the end, we'll also invite people to, to ask questions using the mic. So I shall shut up and hand over to the other Sally, Sally Brown. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm speaking today on behalf of Kay Samble and myself. Kay did the, um, the uh, real life meeting, and it was agreed I would do this one. But Kay is also in the text um, chat, helping um, me keep on the on target, which she'll tell you is quite a challenge. Um, I wanted us to together to look at changing feedback practice at three different institutions. Kay and I have worked together for many years, and I would like at this point to acknowledge uh, the work of Liz McDowell, who was, as many of you will know, instrumental in set setting up the original uh, conference um, on assessment that was based at Northumbria many, many years ago that Kay and I were both involved in. Um, in looking at institutional context, I'm going to be considering three different institutions, all of which we've had associations with. 
we all, I think, agree that giving feedback, detailed and developmental feedback is probably the single most important thing we can do, particularly if we want to bring on students who've had disadvantage. And Kay, Liz McDowell and I worked together at Northumbria. I worked at Leeds Beckett. And I've been working alongside Margaret Price and Sharon Waller together with Erica Morris on Anglia Ruskin's major assessment improvement approach. So working through all those things together, Kay and I have been thinking about how we could take forward the work of our original 20-year-old impact investment project where we looked at the impact of innovative feedback on staff and students. And in this session, we plan to talk about how these institutional approaches can impact um, long term over uh, um, a, a, an institution. So the three universities are the University of Northumbria, based in Newcastle, which is where I live. And Kay lives just outside Newcastle, as does Liz. And following on from the innovative work of Kay and Liz, uh, the university was awarded a Centre for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, which was a very substantially funded series of projects. When I left Northumbria, I went to Leeds Beckett, where I was PDC. The only PDC I know for assessment, learning, and teaching, because I included that in my title, if you get assessment right, I used to say, lots of other things follow on. In more recently, I've been working on the project, which is uh, hosted at Anglia Ruskin, aiming to substantially change the way assessment and feedback work. So when you look at the funding for Northumbria, 1.3 million in capital funding and 500,000 recurrent funding for five years. This was something that 74 UK institutions were in receipt of. And I think if you look across the board, I can say this because I was not directly involved in it, the work of Liz and Kay and five subject specialists had very high impact on the university. And what worked particularly well there was the very close links and support they had from senior managers. And Kay's work in particular was very important indeed as part of a holistic model of assessment for learning. And she's published widely about that. Northumbria University had uh, substantial activities developing staff and student assessment literacy. I think this is probably what they're most known for. And the fact they had associates across the whole university involved in this, three national teaching fellows, lots of people internally promoted, and key point, student assessment for learning officers. They promoted engagement right across the university. And if you have a look at the legacy of work, there are still people who are going back to those events and developmental activities, their reading groups, their joint projects, um, the little tiny internal guides that we started when I was there, red guides, and then student co-authored publications, very popular F word about feedback, CPD modules. And then Northumbria and early had the SIG conferences, 2007-2010 leading to lots and lots of publications, and a very strong research and development program, uh, again, involving not only Liz and Kay, but Nicola Ryman and others. So I think you can see that that's quite a major program. At least back here, I was working with rather different numbers. I was leading on assessment. And one of the things we did was making the return of feedback within three weeks for our continuing students mandatory. Uh, we did actually take quite a tight line on this. Well, having got the strategy together, I worked very closely with the associate deans to try and make sure that everybody was actually doing it. But we weren't just focusing on actually giving the feedback. We were very keen indeed to make sure that students were making good use of it. We found that with this. Uh, approach that involved convincing people it was worth doing and tight monitoring, more than 80% uh, returned work with good feedback within three weeks. Our governors wanted to know why it wasn't 100%, but then I think this is uh, something you just have to keep working at. We saw fairly substantial improvements in NSS scores, national student survey scores, which in the UK are something that are very, very key to the way institutions are perceived and in the future possibly through the teaching excellence framework funded. 
What was most exciting for me was the way that the culture of the university changed to some extent, with many more conversations led by our internally promoted teaching fellows about the importance of feedback. And it's crucial, I think, that the work continues now being led by Professor Ruth Pickford. Moving now to the Anglia Ruskin project, um, the Higher Education Academy had a major project called A Marked Improvement, where they brought together more than a dozen UK uh, experts on uh, teaching, particularly uh, feedback, and they selected eight universities with whom to work over a, uh, an extended period, over a year and a half. Um, Anglia Ruskin wasn't one of the funded groups, one of the funded institutions, but they did choose to use two of us, me and Margaret Price from Oxford Brookes University, whose work many of you will know, um, to work with them on a, an extended project that still continues, starting with what we called an assessment fiesta, which was fabulous with themed food and jolly events, and then lots of workshops faculty away days, and because National Student Survey is so important in the UK, they particularly looked at sharing good practice from programmes that had good National Student Survey outcomes in relation to assessment feedback with those who were struggling. And again, this was seen very much as um, an extensive long-term project, and it's still going on. Um, so. The impact has been that uh, in, in the business school, the uh, feedback and assessment marks have gone up dramatically. Um, overall, the whole university scores in NSS on assessment feedback have gone up. But that's just an indicator, if you like, of an inner and invisible change program that means that, again, assessment conversations are very common. And I think there really is across the board, as is reflected in the increased student um, satisfaction, a real commitment to improving uh, assessment. And some of you who were at the um, Cambria conference um, in Manchester were aware that Anglia has now, with, led by Erica Morris, with me and Margaret Price, started producing an album of resources which are going to include um, activities, uh, little guidelines, suite of videos and so on. These are eventually going to be made available, but they're just launching internally in the first place. And they are continuing to uh, invest in this project, so you might want to particularly look at the um, paper by Sharon Waller and Erica Morris at the CEDA conference. Drawing particularly on the idea that we want to improve assessment literacy, um, I'm drawing on Kay's work here. It's a concept that we are increasingly thinking about, not just for students, but also for staff. That is, familiarity with the language and process of assessment. And that literacy is meant to convey a basic set of operational abilities that can be built on and can be extended. And we want to work very hard to enhance staff feedback literacy, that is getting staff to really understand the impact of what their feedback is going to have on students. I talk about feedback as being transformative. That is to say, if assessment doesn't change behaviours and practices by students, what are we doing with it? So we need to shift conceptually towards a developmental approach. We argue that to become assessment literate requires access to resources, new ideas, models, etc., but also people as change agents, champions. Lots of time on task, lots of dialogue, lots of participation, and a whole series of events for extended dialogue are the kinds of things we were talking about at all three universities Kay and I have been describing here today. So what are our generic learning points? What would we propose? Well, the university where I worked in the middle of period of this, where the government wanted a very quick fix, um, we had to argue that slow and transformative development has much more impact than trying to fix things fast. It does help to have some money. Uh, the Settle had lots of money. When I was PDC, I had uh, over a million a year for learning and teaching activities I could spend. Um, Sharon Waller and colleagues at Anglia have invested money too. 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that huge amounts of money have the maximum impact. For it to really work, long-term ownership by senior managers is essential for sustainability. And it's easy to see how once you lose champions, it's that activities can just dribble away. So it's really key that those of us who are educational developers work very closely with senior managers to convince them and bring them on board. The second thing I particularly found when I was working in changing practice was all the exhortations and shouting and diktats and fiats have no effect whatsoever unless people are using evidence-based scholarship. And one of the reasons we've been able to make change is because we never say, do this because I say so. We say, here's a really good way to do things, and here's the evidence that backs up why you might want to do so. And the third factor that Kay and I have identified is that it really helps to have committed, passionate, and convincing change agents. Those are well-informed people, but they're also going to be people who have the um, ability to take others with them. Again, building on real scholarly development. Here's some resources you might want to look at. Um, we particularly have been in, influenced by the work of Graham Gibbs and uh, David Nicholl and others. Uh, I particularly point you towards Kay's book there with Kay and Linda on assessment for learning and also the Escalate, um, which is uh, the former HEA um, Education Subject Centre uh, organisation. Kay's work with colleagues on rethinking feedback in higher education, and indeed my own there. So, in terms of websites, uh, we particularly like the work of Edinburgh, uh, Northumbria, St Brooks, and Wise HKU. And I think there's plenty there to draw on. So if you want to contact us, here's how we are. Um, we're delighted to have the opportunity to work with colleagues in this discussion this morning. I've been talking, so I get through my 10 minutes, and I'm now going to look subsequently at uh, the text box to see what you've been saying to me. Here are some references we've used, just selected references, and I'll now pause and get ready to pass on to um, my colleague, um, Angela and Dave. Dave, I think, working from Plymouth, which is a place I always also do a fair amount of work. Thank you very much indeed, Sally. It's the other Sally here. Um, I'm just going to, as we do the handover, I, I've been sort of noting the, the comments in the chat box. There's been a lot of discussion. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the timeliness of feedback and what we think about three weeks and whether we think actually that's, that's fast enough. Um, there's been a, an interesting point about the um, um, picking up again from from, uh, from Sue's keynote at the conference. There's been an interesting point made about the potential workload implications of um, obviously getting people return uh, return work more quickly and and improving their feedback, which I think the next talk will be picking up on as well. Um, there's been the perennial difficulty of actually getting students to pay attention to what we've got, and then there's been quite a lot of discussion about the uh, the whole uh, staff assessment literacy point. Um, the question I'm just going to ask one question of you, Sally, which was one that was raised right at the end, which was what sort of evidence have you found to be powerful in actually convincing colleagues of you know, change, change in practice. I think we might have lost Sally, though. Um, in which case... Can you I hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Right. I'll just make that point fairly quickly. Working at Leeds Beckett, the unions were saying, uh, we don't think there's any evidence whatsoever that fast feedback has any impact, and we don't know whether students want it or not. Actually talking with colleagues and saying, look, here is the evidence, and we involved the student union, and the student union said, yes, we really do want fast feedback, and that had more impact than any kind of heavy-handed managerial approach. We also had, at the same time, troubleshoot a problem 
which was one dean in one faculty was trying to make people teach out of country at the same time as doing their assessment. And the change that we had to make was not to change our policy, but actually to encourage, i.e. make, our dean change his practices and not send his markers to work abroad. So I think there's a, a combination of evidence-based approaches there together with uh, sensible management decisions about not expecting staff to be miracle workers and teach and mark at the same time. Thank you very much indeed, Sally. That's great. Um, I'd say there'll be more discuss time for to discuss many of the points that are going on in the chat box at the moment when we get to the end. Um, I would say that I'm probably the luckiest person alive because I didn't actually get to any of the three talks we've got today on the day because I was chairing other sessions. Um, which, so it means that I've heard lots and lots of interesting stuff and I'm now getting the opportunity to hear more again. And I've certainly had a lot of this um, presentation that we're going to hear now from Dave. Um, I've certainly heard quite a lot about some colleagues who attended it. Um, there's been quite a lot of discussion about it, it going around already. So I'm absolutely delighted to hand over to Dave Morrison who's going to talk about half as much but twice as good. So thank you very much, Dave. All right, uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Yes, um, half as much, but twice as good. The principle behind this title, which comes out of the, uh, the evidence that we gathered over the project, which I'll introduce in a second, is the idea that by giving less feedback, but more effective feedback, we can actually uh, decrease our workload, but also at the same time, increase the student response and student acceptance of the feedback they get. Um, this came out of a project called LEAF, uh, Leading, Assess Leading Enhancements in Assessment and Feedback. It was a small project across four, uh, four major universities over two and a half years. And uh, uh, at the time of the ending of it, uh, for my part, four subjects, history, biosciences, business management, and, and engineering with a focus on trying to figure out how to get feedback improved across any subject um, for the students. And what we do with that was we, we went and we asked the students, we went, met with student focus groups, but uh, we, we did student surveys, but also we met with staff, teaching staff uh, in, in all of those subjects. We met with every single teaching st staff member we could find and asked them, how do you do feedback assessment? What are your problems with it? When do your students pick it up? When do they not? And we compared these things across and then tried to figure out, well, what is one side saying? What is the other side saying? So. Uh, briefly, uh, first we'll look at, and these are not problems that I believe anyone here should be unfamiliar with. Students complained first about consistency, then complained about timeliness, uh, staff complained that we couldn't get them to engage, and then of course bringing that all together is, is, is the key point to all of this. What did, we, what did we decide we might be able to do about it? So with feedback consistency, um, students, we know the students are upset about the consistency of feedback they get. Sometimes uh, like the first comment says they just get a statement that says no on it. At times they get great feedback. Um, but another thing that they pointed out, and this started, this is what really started to build where we were going with the project, is they complained a lot about different marking systems across different programs. Um, in the Scottish system, that's more important probably because you have a lot more students taking electives in their early years, but any students doing, uh, doing joint honors, any students taking electives uh, elsewhere have this problem in the U.S., this is likely to be a con considerable problem, and I'm not exactly sure how much that affects Australia or not, but I believe it does as well. Um, but, but that was one of the big things that really gave us the, the push to start going to where we were, that there was an inconsistent enough, see, not just across particular markers or, and particular assignments, but across subjects, and students were confused about how to deal with that and how to make sense of their assessment across them. And what they started asking for in the workshops that we ran with them, in the focus groups we ran with them, and in the surveys, was a consistent format for the feedback. It wasn't that they were asking for consistent um, types of comments. They were looking for a consistent format was, cons was what they were asking for. And they asked for this in every single subject. And they were asking for it not just across assignments and different markers and different modules, but they wanted it across subjects. And of course, that's where you start really talking about institutional change because that involves getting subjects to actually try to do the same thing involving assessment and feedback. And if anyone's ever even attempted to do that, yeah, they'll know that this is this is a tall order. 
and that's where bringing evidence into the staff starts coming in, and I will get around to that in a bit. Hopefully, I'll have time to get to that. The other thing students talked about was the timeliness. And again, we know that timely feedback is something that students have been upset about for a very long time. It's been one, consistently one of their biggest complaints for years. But when we went and we asked them directly whether or not detail or timeliness is more important to you, unanimously in every subject we asked, they said timeliness is much more important. We would rather have almost no feedback if we, as long as we get some feedback in time for it to be useful. And that is, that's, it was at that point really that half as much but twice as good started to cohere as, an, as, as a notion, as that, that maybe something, maybe our focus on detail was, 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 was crippling us somehow. And this is some of the stuff the students were saying about that. Um, just that they need the feedback. We asked them whether or not the, what, what they meant when they said that the feedback was too late very consistently is when it comes back right before exams or just after exams or when there isn't time to use it for change. The students showed a very, very high level actually of feedback literacy in certain areas. They understood feed forward very, very well. Uh, they knew that their feedback was supposed to be something they could use to improve their work. Um, they didn't know everything there was to know about feedback, but this was the reason they wouldn't go pick it up, because it was late. They, didn't, they talked over and over again, I don't bother to get my feedback because it's come back after any assignments I could use it on. But the quote in the center here is the one that really hit home. The student that said, it's our job to hand it in on time. It's their job to get it back on time. They should do better than us. And that really pushed the point that what the students expect is for us to be an example to them, to actually do a better job of being on time and getting things done effectively than themselves. Um, and the students, um, after this comment, were uh, agreed, you know, why should we stress ourselves to get our work done on time if it's not going to come back on time? And part of the problem, I think, um, is, is question eight on the NSS. And I'm going to go ahead and, you know, stake my claim on saying this is a problem, and I'm not the first to say it. Um, I've received detailed comments on my work, and it was mistakes quantity for quality. And the students are aware of this problem, or at least when we asked them, they were aware of this problem. Uh, the recommendations in the works are to change it to helpful comments instead of detailed comments. Whether or when that actually comes through uh, is an unknown at this point, but hopefully that will happen. But detailed comments, students are saying this is not the most important thing that they want. Not to say detailed feedback isn't a good thing when you can get it, though. The reason for this is that students are busy. They are as busy as we are, um, especially in this modern era. They are working part-time. They have carer duties. They are at a key social point in their lives, and socializing is very, very important to them. Maybe it's not more important than their studies. Maybe it is more important than their studies. But they are not going to take the time to read, to try and decipher, locate, um, uh, and figure out a different type of feedback and a different range of feedback every single time they get a new assignment. They need to be able to do so quickly. Less feedback, though, can be more effective. And this is where, this is where we came to. If it, is, if it is constructed clearly and constructed effectively, it can be more effective than, than detailed feedback. Uh, two pages of feedback can be reduced to much less and the students can understand, the students can use it, and the students will want to see it. And probably if there's only one thing to take home from, from this talk, it's this question. If a student is only going to read your feedback for 30 seconds, what is it you want them to take away from that 30 seconds? If that's all you're going to get out of them, no matter how much feedback you write, what key things do you want them to take away from it? Fortunately, we already have a format for doing something like this. There's already something that across subjects um, is a familiar structure. It's the, called the executive summary. When we write reports in any subject, this, this is a thing that, that happens. It's always right at the start. It summarizes everything and puts things in, this, in, in a simple structure and puts the key points out. The most important part of it, which ties to exactly what the students were wanting is, it has a universal base format and it has a universal base location. It's designed to be quick, clear, and consistent. Now, there can be a lot more detail inside, but this tells you what, what is coming, what's the, what's the high points, and if you want to know more, then you look on. 
um, it, it can draw you in, which is another thing. Uh, if the students aren't going to read it normally, if they see something interesting in this executive summary structure, they may want to look inside and understand more of it. So how do we construct this? What we want to get is probably the three to five most helpful points. Now, there are reasons behind choosing three to five. Um, there hasn't been a whole lot of research, and this actually surprises me, on how much feedback or how many points of feedback are good to give the students. I know Margaret Price has done some stuff fairly recently that has suggested um, three to five points. Um, and that work, I think, needs to be expanded to a lot more subjects and more institutions. I think it would be good to go there. The only other thing I was able to find was something from 1997 in, um, in history that suggested this. The reason that we went with three to five points is actually due to something called Miller's Law. If you go outside of this into psychology, um, and that what Miller's Law says is very simply that all humans can only hold in, in short-term working memory uh, seven plus or minus two key points or, or um, individual ideas. Now, if we take that, if we err on the side of caution and say that the ma that that's five, that should say the maximum points that you would expect a student to quickly uh, be able to hold in their memory and take away from the sheet that they see is five. So, maximum of five, three to five most helpful points. If these are clear on one spot, students are going to be able to see it, always know where to find it, always know how to read it across subjects. Uh, what should they have in those three to five points? And this gets to a lot of previous work that has been done. Uh, David Nickel, David Bow, David Carlos, uh, uh, Graham Gibbs, and many others. Uh, and it's actionable, positive, feeding forward, clear, and of course connected to the ILOs. Um, and that, um, that is actually where we came to at the end of our project and is where we're moving on to now in the next phase of actually implementation. Uh, and this is where we're at currently, um, and this is at Glasgow. I'm not at Glasgow anymore, but I'm keeping in touch with the project. Um, but Amanda, Amanda Sykes, who couldn't be here today, is carried forward there. Um, and these are the tools that are going out to, to staff, but these are also available to students. And one of the important things that we tried to push was that there needs to be a transparency of the same resources for staff and for students on feedback literacy. So they're not getting different language. Um, and we reduced now that five, five um, items to four, timely, positive, constructive, and clear. Uh, and that's where we're at, so thank you very much. And um, if there's any questions now or uh, later, happy to answer. Thank you very much, Dave. Again, there's been a lot of chat going on in the chat box, and we'll come up and uh, you know discuss some of them more at the end. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, I'm just going to take executive authority, if you like, and ask a question that comes out of some of the discussion that's been going on, which is there's been a discussion in the chat box about um, essentially making feedback constructive as opposed to destructive. Do you think there's sometimes a tension between us wanting to be, if you like, nice and positive to students and saying too many words? Um, yeah, well, I think trying, um, I think probably, if I'm getting the idea of that right, it's the notion of trying to uh, put a positive spin on a negative thing and then putting and, and that constructing three to four paragraphs of trying to make it sound nice. Um, or that might not but be what was meant at all, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, this, what I meant. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, definitely, because I have seen some of that in some of the data that we looked at during the project. Um, it's, you can absolutely say a negative thing in a positive way. And by positive the thing, positive here is not that we need to tell students that they've done a great job or that they've done something right. You can, you can positively tell someone they've, done, they've completely messed up what they've done and done it completely wrong. And that should be very, very clear in and of itself. You can do this in two sentences. You did this absolutely wrong. The positive part comes, but it can be improved, or but if you do this, or however, uh, this is how you, you go about um, changing it, or this is what you should look at. It doesn't have to be terribly long. Um, if you want to get it through to them quickly, if the student sees that, quickly understands it, sees that there is a way to go about it, but doesn't completely understand this way that they could improve it. Uh, ideally, this would be when they would want to look into further uh, feedback that might be within the document or to actually contact the staff member and say, well, what did you mean by this? 
it's kind of in, hope, in most cases we would hope that it would be clear enough and they'd take it right away and say like, oh, there's the way I improve it. I'll go do it. Otherwise, we would hope that this quick, clear, uh, constructive thing would be the hook that uh, would reel them in. That's lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Dave. So it is really the concept of an executive summary, so that which is what you said. Thank you very much indeed. Hopefully, more time for more discussion later. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our, our final speaker. So thanks to Juliet for waiting so patiently. And Juliet Williams from Winchester is going to speak about changing colours, what happens when you make enhancement an imperative. So over to you, Juliet. Thanks, Sally, um, and good morning, everyone, or good evening from uh, wherever you are at this point. Um, so, yes, I'll be talking about um, how we have used the tester approach at Winchester and how we embedded it in our essentially a quality assurance process um, in our periodic review process. So, how it works and how it's really come to be a, a, quite a success at Winchester. So, just to give um, a bit of context then. The University of Winchester has led the Transforming the Experience of Students Through Assessment project, which is the TESTA project, um, and it was originally a national teaching fellowship project from 2009 to 2012, um, but it's kind of been stayed far beyond its project life through its sector-wide prominence as an enhancement approach. So TESTA is really a research and change process, and it focuses on investigating program assessment patterns in order to enhance assessment and feedback design and in turn improve the student learning experience. So more than 50 UK universities um, use TESTA or engage with TESTA in some way. And at a recent international conference on assessment in higher education, the conference chair described TESTA as having brought about a step change in thinking about assessment in the UK sector. Uh, the project leader of TESTA is Dr. Tansy Jessup, um, who some of you may be familiar with, and she's led TESTA from Winchester since its beginnings, um, and she's now leading it from, from Southampton Solent University. So at Winchester then, TESTA began as a kind of opt-in approach, so those program teams who were keen on uh, learning and teaching enhancement and uh, rethinking assessment design opted in during the early years of the project. Uh, program teams found that TESTA provided rich program level evidence about assessment and feedback and that they could use this uh, as a catalyst to make strategic changes. And as a result of uh, TESTA's success and alongside the merging of our quality and enhancement unit in 2014, our Vice Chancellor mandated that TESTA should be undertaken on all undergraduate programs going through uh, periodic review. So TESTA was therefore uh, scaled up and has since become embedded in university's revalidation process, providing a kind of evidence-informed and systematic approach to ensuring excellence in the student experience of assessment and feedback. However, one concern uh, we had in making TESTA and the TESTA approach a kind of imperative was that TESTA itself would change its colours and shift from a more exciting kind of enhanced initiative to a dull, homogenised tick box exercise. Uh, that not everyone and not every program would engage with as we'd hoped. Uh, but we were, on the whole, largely wrong in our assumptions. And since 2014, 10 undergraduate programs at Winchester have successfully undertaken TESTA as part of their program revalidation. And this coming year, further four programs will undergo TESTA. So it's here, really, that I wanted to uh, kind of draw on some data from the 10 programs who have engaged with TESTA and get a sense of what assessment and feedback looks like um, and what that might suggest about assessment design at Winchester, and also to be able to reflect on the changes programs made uh, to assessment design having gone through TESTA. So there's a lot of data on this slide. Um, the TESTA process um, is conducted and is made up of a uh, kind of mixed methods uh, approach. So as part of that, we conduct a TESTA audit in which we map assessment across the three years of a degree program. And this is where this data has come from. So this is the data from 10 programs based on that mapping exercise. So as you can see from the slide, uh, we look at the total number of assessments that students will come across in their three years. We then break that down into the number of summative and formative assessments, the varieties of assessments, the proportion of exams, and then the kind of estimated amount of oral and written feedback a student will receive during their study. 
So there is a lot of data there, so I'm just going to tease out a couple of things from that. Uh, on the whole, there's a high number of assessment tasks for our students across their three-year degrees. It ranges from about 28 to 85 assessments across the three years, which equates to between around nine, which is relatively low, and 28 assessment tasks per year. So to put that in context, at Winchester we have um, two 12-week semesters, so we have 24 weeks of teaching. So 28 assessments in a year is is more than one assessment per week, so it's a very high number. Um, and that suggests that some programmes are, are over-assessing their students. And when we look at that in more detail, we can also see that the ratio of formative to summative assessment is proportionately very low, with the exception of programme number two, um, which has more formative than summative assessment. So again, it suggests that perhaps we're not giving our students enough opportunities for feedback or for mastery, which might allow them to engage with deeper and more critical learning uh, and perform better in the more kind of high stakes summative assessment tasks. Similarly, there are kind of varying um, assessment tasks, but there are uh, differing varieties of assessments, with the highest being about 27 different varieties that a student will face during their time. So I've just kind of uh, summarized those findings on the next slide for you. So how do program teams engage with these findings um, and the feedback from students as part of the kind of tester process? And how do they carry this forward into so rethinking assessment design for the revalidation process? Well, on the whole, the data seems to allow program teams uh, to step back and reflect on assessment design at a programmatic level. It allows for program teams to think about assessment and feedback from the student perspective and understand better how assessment design and sequencing can impact students' learning. And as such, um, engaging with the tester approach has had a kind of direct impact on rethinking, uh, reshaping and redesigning of programs as they go through the revalidation process. And as part of the, the revalidation, we ask program teams to comment on how tester has informed their thinking and practice surrounding assessment design, and also what, if any, uh, changes they've made to assessment on the program as a result of tester. So in the next slides, I just have a few um, comments from program teams and their feedback on tester, which I'll let you kind of read through uh, rather than kind of reiterating them to you. And I'll just go to the next slide. And the next slide. Okay, so we can see then that TESTA has had a direct, a direct impact on the redesign of assessment and feedback on programs undergoing the revalidation. And predominantly, this is through rebalancing formative and summative assessment, rethinking assessment patterns to create kind of planned cycles of learning for students across the whole program, and providing students with more opportunities for formative feedback. And as well as this, TESTA has also confirmed areas of strength and good practice for program teams, which is really important um, in terms of uh, the revalidation and redesign. So we can begin to understand then why TESTA as an enhancement approach has worked so successfully as embedded in the established periodic review change process. Program teams understand that TESTA is an enhancement approach rather than a tick box exercise, and that it builds into an existing assurance process the opportunity for evidence-based enhancement. The test approach offers a supportive space in which teams can reflect, rethink, and reshape assessment and feedback design strategically, and in such a way that enhances their students' learning. I think it's important to say here that test is it's not an approach imposed on program teams, but one which supports teams in the changes they want to make with most teams using TESTA and, test and the TESTA findings to reshape assessment and feedback design in ways that best suit the needs of the program and its students. So through building in opportunities for enhancement um, into these kind of existing assurance processes, 
We have added value to these processes and succeeded in engaging whole program teams in programmatic level enhancement. And as more undergraduate programs engage with TESTA as part of their revalidation, the shift in thinking around assessment and feedback design and the impact of this on students' learning has great potential to extend across the institution and become embedded in thinking far beyond the periodic review process. So I think it's for this reason that we found that TESTA really hasn't changed its colours at Winchester and it continues to be a really useful and impactful enhancement tool. So um, that's where I'll kind of finish up. There's a few references there and thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Juliet. Um, interestingly, I, I had a question of my own, um, which has just been asked rather better than I was going to phrase it by, by Pip in the chat box. Um, I, I'll just read it, um, which is really, have, have you had any resistance? Um, I'll, I'll read the question. Have you found resistance some, from some who aren't as heavy assessment users, not wanting to move to better but fewer assessments? Essentially, I'll widen that, broaden that slightly. Have you had any resistance from program teams? Um, we've had very little resistance. Um, I've been working with Tester for a year, year now. Um, we have some program teams that engage with the process less than others. Um, we have some programs that are very enthusiastic and others that aren't so enthusiastic. Um, however, on the whole, I think we haven't had kind of strong resistance to the approach and to using tester program teams tend to quite value um, the student feedback that we get through focus groups and questionnaires and also the kind of mapping process that I talked about um, the kind of tester audit process so there are teams that are uh, maybe less engaged than others we've had no teams um, that are just fully kind of resistant to tester and generally teams find that it is actually useful in some way or another and that it's there for them to do what they want within their in their redesign of the program. Thank you very much indeed. There's a, a follow up which is do you think there's a stick or a carrot in terms of encouraging participation in the process? Um, is that in terms of encouraging program teams to participate? Um, I think so probably. It's not my question, but yes. I think Tester, it's, I think our concern in terms of building it into the kind of quality assurance process is, is that it would become a stick more than a carrot, uh, maybe less attractive as an enhancement approach, um, like I said, and, and become more of a kind of tick box thing that you have to do and you have to say that you've done it and you have to comment on it, that kind of thing. However, I think because of the approach and because um, it's really there for program teams to do what they wish with and to engage with on, on whichever level they they would like to. Um, it's also, uh, I think both presentations before mine have talked about the importance of evidence-based um, literature and, and things in, in bringing about institutional change or departmental change and TESTA is very much embedded in that. So I think um, the notion of it as an enhancement tool and something that's worthwhile for program teams is, is still there. Thank you very much indeed, Juliet. And, and thank you. I'd like to thank all three speakers um, for essentially sticking with sticking to time, so that we've got this time where we've got a good five minutes um, to, to to have a discussion on the general points. Now, this is the point at which, if anybody's got particular questions that they'd like to ask, um, you can do it by one of two ways: either raise your hand or type the question in the box and I will um, attempt to control the whole process. Um, I would just say there's one thing here different for those of you who are regular transforming assessment uh, web, uh, webinar participants. Please say who you're asking the question of. I'm going to kick off while people are just thinking about what they want to say uh, and raising their hand if they want to um, by saying that I think the two primary things that have been going on in the discussion box have been firstly around what we think timely is and secondly around the whole workload issue, how we can improve our practice at the same time as, as, as cutting workload. So I'm going to start off by asking the three speakers, um, in terms of assessment feedback, what do you think timely is? It probably this probably pertains more to the first two. So Sally, I'm going to ask you first. 
Thank you. I mean, this is obviously a topic that was much discussed at um, all the institutions I've worked in, and the three weeks we came down with at all three institutions was much more a compromise than necessarily um, a, 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 an actual um, ultimate and final solution to things. Uh, Still, race. My husband talks about 24-hour feedback as being the ideal, but it really is a trade-off, isn't it, between being able to get feedback back to students fast and then being able to use it before they go on to their next assignment, and being able to do it well. And I regularly work with people who teach cohorts of 400 students, and even if you have several markers on the case, you've still got to have some moderation around that. For me, the key thing is it's got to be back at a time when students are able to make use of it, but also um, it has to be at a time where we can enter into some kind of dialogue with students. Just tucking them the feedback doesn't do the job. We've got to try and make sure that they engage with the feedback, and that's a whole different topic, I think, really, but key to making sure that they use the feedback. I think that's a really good point. Thank you, Sally. Um, the other uh, point that Rennie has made during the discussion has been um, around the fact that there are instances where you might do the you as a marker might provide the feedback as quickly as you like, but then it could get delayed by the need for there to be a delay in processes where you've got marking going on in several different places. Um, so yeah, there are definitely tensions. I'm just going to ask um, Dave if you'd if like to add anything to that. Uh, yeah, well, I can add uh, a little bit to it, but I would more or less agree across the board on it. Um, yeah, if you can get that feedback back in 24 hours, students will love you and they will enjoy your class and they'll feel they're getting something out of it. That's not going to be feasible in every situation. But um, one, another thing students did ask for in every single subject in our, in our study was they wanted, um, well, because actually when, when we talked to staff, a lot of staff said, we think this, the students are over-assessed. We think they're getting too much assessment. Can you please ask them? Can you please check? Every, every single time we ask students, they said, no, no, we don't have a problem. We want more assessment. We want more assessment during the course. We want more coursework with formative feedback. So actually, uh, what came out was it's not the staff, it's, the, it's, it's not the students being over-assessed. It was the staff having too much marking. And a lot, some of that comes down to if there's 400 students and there isn't p any possible way to give the, uh, even small amounts of feedback in a, in a, in a, in a quick amount of time, then the question becomes, is that the correct assessment? Because if the assessment uh, um, accurately assesses what they're supposed to be learning, that's oftentimes what we're looking at. But if, if it's also an assessment we can't give feedback on in a, in, in a sufficient amount of time, is it going to do its job as a, an effective assessment? And that's something I think we have to really consider. So if we can't get feedback back in time, by any means, maybe the assessment itself is the problem. Um, hopefully that answered some of it. I think it did and actually that's quite a good point to move on to Juliet. I feel a little bit unfair because obviously the first two uh, talks were concentrating on feedback and so the timeliness issue came up. Juliet's had a different flavour to it as well as a different colour to it perhaps um, but I think this issue of you know how you can do this whilst Keeping staff on board is a uh, is a key one. Juliet, I don't know if there's anything you want to say. Um, I mean, I absolutely agree with Dave's point about um, the importance of of assessment design and and really designing assessment that best um, suits the needs of our students and their learning. Um, but again, there's there's the the kind of workload balance as well, and I think. Um, it's it's a tricky one. I think what we find working with testers is that that's always initially um, maybe the concern of program teams. It's okay if we're if we're really looking at assessment, you know, we're already stretched and we're already um, you know trying really hard and, and not always managing to cope and give timely feedback and 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 do what's best for students in that regard because of workload. Um, I think. Some of that can be overcome with rebalancing summative and formative, but again, it's very discipline um, specific uh, how you design your feedback that best suits uh, your students and doesn't kind of compromise your time. Um, so it's it's a tricky one. Thank you very much. Um, there's a discussion here uh, going on in the moment uh, in the chat box, two points. The first one was to remember that there can be a place for um, uh, computer mark 
assessed feedback as computer generated feedback. It's my own area of work, um, sophisticated questions. Uh, I'm not talking about multiple choice questions, I'm talking about things that do a lot more than that. Um, but there can be a place, whatever you think about it, for a balanced use of feedback. Of course, the other point that's coming out is, is use of, of, of self-assessment, peer assessment. So really, if you like, an awful lot of the, the agendas uh, to do with assessment feedback more generally are coming up, which I think is, is very interesting. Um, I think I'm just going to I'm going to ask one final question of the speakers in just a moment. Um, just in doing that, I think perhaps I would also ask them to reflect that time is moving on very quickly in terms of us having different maybe having different students from the ones that we had five, ten years ago. Um, and so perhaps timeliness, the issue of timeliness is altering. Um, perhaps that's something we, we need to be reflecting on. However, um, just to be fair to everybody as we come to an end, I'm actually going to, um, yeah, there's an interesting point there about whether audio feedback is indeed faster. There's a huge debate about that, about whether it is actually faster, easier. Um, people's views alter, very. Um, so coming on to my final question, I'm going to ask each of the speakers in turn, you've talked about lots of ideas. Um, for what we might do to improve the assessment and feedback that we give to our students, remembering that they're our, our key stakeholders. Um, but I'm just going to give you one. I'm going to say if we were to do one thing to bring the change that we've all looked to see for a long time now, what one thing can we do to give us change at an institutional level? What would it be? So first of all, I'm going to ask Sally Brown. Um, I worked uh, along with a number of people involved in this discussion on the UK quality assurance uh, framework um, which is our regulatory body in the UK and the change I made to our national framework that I'm most proud of is the fact that I wanted to make sure in the QAA's terms that everyone who assesses is deemed capable of assessment and this involves training. That is to say everybody who assesses, the part-timers, the postgrads who teach, everybody has training in A, how to give feedback that's developmental and positive and B, how to get through it all without killing themselves. That's a really good point, Sally. I, I think I've said in the chat box, my day job is now as head of department of a physics department, essentially. And I think getting that practice to all of us, not just those of us who see ourselves as, as if you like, experts in teaching and learning is, is really, really important. Thank you. Um, and next, I'm going to ask the same question, the one change that you would like to see, Dave. I'm not hearing you, Dave. I don't know if you need to press the talk button. Okay, yep, yep. It didn't click when I clicked it. All right. Um, the one thing that I think we would need to do in order to get institutional change to actually happen, to actually take place, um, is something that we did at, at uh, and, and this we didn't know it was going to have this effect, but it did, at our workshop uh, to the staff, uh, show it, talking to them about LEAF, and the outcomes that we'd had, and we thought, well, how are we going to convince them that, that, that these ideas are good? What we did was we, we talked to some students. We got uh, one student who gave us a complete portfolio of her feedback over, over three and a half years, everything that she'd been given back, and we made copies of this, and we just dropped it on the table in front of, um, in front of tables of four to eight staff members. Uh, from all different subjects and said, can you please interpret any of this, um, make any sense of it, or find any kind of patterns? What should the student do to make their work better? That had an incredible impact and pushed the whole point home of everything we had said more than any amount of policy changes or uh, reference to, uh, to, to, to research or any, I mean, because uh, the question came up earlier uh, about evidence-based stuff and what evidence speaks to, to staff. And we did have some staff say, well, you've done student surveys, but they're not really, you know, representative. You've done focus groups, but they're not really representative. Um, this portfolio did not get any response like that. It was all positive. That's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Dave. That's great. And finally, uh, Juliet, what one thing can we do to bring the changes to institutional level? 
Well, I think, I mean, changing a uh, culture of an institution in terms of what we do around assessment and feedback is, is so challenging. But I think I totally would have to agree with Sally um, and her point about engaging all of us as teachers and lecturers and academics in, you know, training around assessment and feedback. And also, I think, importantly, is engaging senior management in, um, you know, the importance of getting assessment and feedback right and engaging them in training also. I think it's hard um, to know whether it's bottom up or top down or both, um, but I think there's room. I think there is room for both. So I agree with Sally, I think, on that one. Thank you very much again, Juliet, and, and especially I, th I think we've, we're running out of time, but it's been a huge amount of discussion going on in the chat box. I, I'd like to I'm hand over to, to Matt in just a second. I want to just do a couple of things, though. I want to thank Matthew hugely uh, and um, Jeff for inviting us to be part of Transforming Assessment in this way. I think we can guarantee that this is going to be an ongoing relationship, that there's a lot that we can do together as, as, as two groups. Um, the second thing I want to do is to thank everybody that's participated and everything, and finally, particularly to thank Sally and Dave and Juliet for you know, going through this process, sticking to time, and making such an entertaining session. So thank you very much indeed. And I'm going to hand over to Matthew. Okay, thank you, Sally, uh, Sally, Dave, uh, who else I have? Uh, so many people. Um, brilliant session, great conversations. Um, I'm just going to type in the feedback survey, so please kindly fill it in. Um, as I indicated in the sex chat, the next week's session will be on uh, using video feedback. Um, so Michael from uh, my very own Monash University will be speaking. So thank you very much. Um, please feel free to stick around, but I'm going to stop the recording here.